My guest today is a native Champaign resident, a graduate of Southern Illinois University and the University of Illinois. He is an internationally acclaimed Oscar and Emmy nominated filmmaker. Some of his films include Journey from Zanskar, Boys to Men, and of course, Hoop Dreams. His passion is real people, real stories, and real struggles. And I am very pleased to welcome to Illinois Pioneers, Frederick Marks. Thanks very much. My pleasure. For being here. Nice to be home. Uh, I, it's, it's really good to have you here. There was so much I want to talk about, some about some of your life in Champaign-Urbana and your experiences growing up and some of the movies that you've made. But just as a, as a way in, as a documentary maker, there are clearly particular kinds of stories that you want to tell. What stories do you really like? What stories are you drawn to? Well, the simplest way to put it is I, I love underdog stories. You know, I just, <clears throat> for whatever reason, was born and then acculturated by my own family with a radar for uh, the oppressed, the forgotten, the ignored uh, of the world. And mm -hmm. so I, you know, so whether it's people of color, uh, poor, the poor, um, uh, youth, elderly, disabled, uh, you know, uh, women or, or those who have different sexual preferences. I'm just drawn to, I, I just identify with them and I'm drawn to telling their stories. And that comes from your parents? To some extent, yes. I mean, I inherited a lot of their values uh, about care and concern for for all the peoples of the world and, and especially those who are the forgotten. Well, tell me more about that, uh, starting with your dad. He was a, a faculty uh, Correct. member of the U of I? Yeah, he was an assistant. Well, that's what brought us here. I was born in Philadelphia. We came here when I was five, and uh, he got his first academic job as an assistant professor of German literature. Hmm. Uh, so, yeah, I, I was recounting just last night that we lived on Bliss Drive, and uh, I. I just love that. <laughs> Do you, one story I read, uh, I, I liked the story a lot, was that your, your parents were involved in left-wing politics and that, uh, in fact, th as a result of that, your dad was blacklisted from the work he had been doing, which was waiting tables, <laughs> and it actually turned out to be a good thing for him, right? Correct. Yeah, it, yeah, it's funny because, yeah, he was just a waiter. He worked at a downtown hotel in Philadelphia and he was called up before the House on American Activities Committee to testify on his political activities. And, um, you know, bless his heart, you know, he, he, he didn't, you know, name names or anything. And uh, they threatened him with um, uh, revoking his citizenship. Mm -hmm. But uh, because he was a recent immigrant from Nazi Germany, he was a Jewish refugee to this country and arrived in very late uh, 39 or early 40. So at any rate, uh, it all rebounded to his benefit when he got blacklisted as a waiter because he got to go back to his first love, which was really academics. And, uh, and then on the GI Bill, to add to the irony, he, he uh, got his PhD and came here. Yeah. So you went to school at, uh, at uni? uni uh, Correct. I? And at some point, and being on the campus, there was a lot of opportunities to see movies. Yes. You seem to get, get drawn into, at least at the beginning, watching a lot of movies. Oh, no question. You know, my dad was one of the two people that founded the so-called Foreign Cinema Club on campus. They used to show movies at the auditorium. And uh, I just inherited that love of movies that my dad had somehow. So I remember as a 15-year-old seeing Ingmar Bergman's film Persona, as part of the summer film club, I had no clue what it meant or what I had just seen, and yet I walked out of there stunned. I was so taken by some experience that I had. So anyway, when I was an undergrad at the U of I, I just started taking film courses, even though my declared major was poli-sci. Mm -hmm. So eventually, I graduated with a double major. I barely squeaked through with my <laughs> required minimum of hours for poli-sci, but I had over 60 hours of film courses. So you were, I, I gather you were in political science because th there was some thought that you might be a lawyer to, to, do, to do good work, to be a social justice lawyer, which was something that your mom really would have liked to see you do. Correct. Yeah, well, and also my mom's dad. I can still hear his voice in my ears. You know, he was uh, 
uh, a, a Jewish immigrant from Russia, and he inherited a lot of the values. And every time I saw him, it's like, Freddie, who needs pictures? I'm telling you, you could be a doctor, you could be a lawyer. Who's going to take care of your mother in old age? You know, and, and it's really sad that he never lived to see the success that I had with Hoop Dreams. Yeah. Because I would have loved to have, have shared that with him. Well, I wanted to talk about some of your film work and about, starting with the thing that, that you will be and maybe always uh, are and maybe always will be best known for, which is Hoop Dreams, mm -hmm. this documentary from 1994 where you uh, followed two young men, two young African-American men, all the way through their high school years. And they were basketball players and they were guys who seemed to have the potential to go on and play professionally. And it, it looks at what is, for, uh, for a lot of people, a big dream, becoming a professional athlete. Mm -hmm. And this was something, I guess, a, a project that grew over time from something sort of smaller to something that it, that it came to be. How did you get started into what became Hoop Dreams? Well, um, my best friend in graduate school was Steve James. And Steve and I were corresponding when I was living in China. And he basically broached the subject of uh, forming a creative partnership where we would work together and make multiple films, do both fiction and documentary films. And in fact, in grad school, we used to talk about different projects and, that we had wanted to do. And in fact, we used to also play uh, pick up basketball together, he and I, because he had his hoop dreams just as I did when I was a kid. So long story short, you know, we started that project. And in fact, the first formal meeting that we had was at my mother's house in Champaign. And I had just uh, busted up my knee from playing basketball. So <laughs> I, I had just had surgery and I was sitting with my leg up and we were sitting there talking about how we were going to make this film. Yeah. So this was, it was uh, a, a remarkable undertaking because you you shot over four years, so you followed these young men all the way through high school. Then there were a couple of years of editing. Mm -hmm. Then there was everything that was involved in trying to get distribution. So how how long did it actually take? Or do you think of, you know, start to Roughly finish? Roughly eight years. Eight years. Yeah. And the first year, you know, starting from that moment in Champaign here was mostly dedicated to research and fundraising. And after a whole year of work, we had raised $2,500. <laughs> so we decided, heck, we're going to start anyway. So, uh, so we did, and yeah. yeah, it took four to four and a half years of shooting, and two to two and a half years of editing, and then about a year after we premiered it at Sundance to blow it up to 35 millimeter from 16 yeah. and get it ready for theaters. So, how how do you persevere on a project that takes that long? Well, it's easy. You get work elsewhere. <laughs> 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 you know, one, one of the beauties of being a, uh, we became a three-headed monster because uh, yeah. we took on a third partner, Peter Gilbert. And the, one of the beauties of that was while one or two of us was off working and making a living because God knows we couldn't pay ourselves to work on Hoop Dreams, the other one or two could keep things going forward. So mm -hmm. that's how we made it work. Yeah. So the, the, the title works on some number of levels and, and partly clearly has to do with the number of hoops that one has to jump through and not just the, the ones that you shoot. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, this movie um, enjoyed, a surpri I think, surprising commercial success. Uh, it, was a, it was very, very well reviewed and uh, I think two uh, of our uh, sort of local heroes, at least in the state of Illinois, and w one guy from here, uh, Siskel and Ebert, had a lot to do with promoting the movie because they, taught, they saw it, said it was really good, helped to promote it. Did, did, it, did it surprise you at all that, that it became as big as it has? Uh, yes, <laughs> absolutely. Um, you know, as you alluded to, when we first started it, we we're making a little half hour program that we hoped and prayed that PBS might broadcast. Yeah. And then it just became this behemoth that just grew and grew and grew. And part of the reason why it grew paradoxically was because we had no money. And as long as we, we, we could basically shoot indefinitely for free, but once we stopped and said, okay, now we got to go into post and now we've got to edit and mm -hmm. do music, et cetera, we didn't have any money for any of that. So we could shoot a long time. Peter was working for nothing. Cartemquin Films gave us free overhead. 
so that was one of the strange ironies of our production. Yeah. Really. So how much did it cost to make? Well, I think we finished it uh, about at about $450,000 uh, to the 16 millimeter print that we premiered in January 94 at Sundance and then we spent an additional 250,000 roughly to blow it up to 35 millimeter to pay all the music rights etc to get it ready for theaters and it made close to 12 million dollars worldwide actually I think box or oh, worldwide maybe yeah. yeah worldwide maybe as yeah one thing about hoop dreams that, that I'm I'm sure you must have thought about that was a risk is it's long Mm -hmm. It's almost three hours long. Mm -hmm. and did anyone along the line say, look, Fred, it's, you can't have a three-hour documentary. People won't sit through well, it. Well, believe me, it. PBS was, was adamant about us trying to get it down to two hours. And we just said, sorry, you know, no can do. Yeah. But, you know, at one point, I, th I thought, I was thinking in the opposite direction. I was thinking, you know, we had 250 hours of footage, and there's a lot of wonderful stuff on the floor, the cutting room floor. I thought about, you know, maybe we could stretch this thing into a five-part miniseries that each part would be as much as two hours, but at least an hour, and just do it in successive nights, you know. Yeah. But at any rate, we, we canned that idea and just went for one finished yeah. program. Dip into the personal again. You're a Buddhist. You've been practicing Buddhist now for more than 20 years? Uh, yeah, I, let's see. It's, yeah, about 25. So when you were growing up and you were a kid, was religion particularly important in your no, not opinion. at all. <laughs> in fact, maybe that's partly why I consider myself a Buddhist now, because I had that, that inquiry that lived quite strong in me uh, from the time I was probably 13, 14. And I started picking up books of Eastern philosophy, anything I could get my hands on that would try to explain the meaning of life to me. <laughs> and, uh, and like a lot of young people, I think that question burns quite strongly. So, you know, I read some books uh, by Alan Watts in particular, and then in 1973, I think it came out, Ram Dass's book, Be Here Now, you know, which was the first sort of breakthrough book to translate some Eastern ideas in, to, into the Western mind. Mm -hmm. And anyway, uh, I, you know, if I could have, if in Champaign-Urbana somebody had taken me by the hand and said, here's how you practice Buddhism, I would have come very willingly, but there wasn't. And so it was only many years later when I was living in New York City that somebody made that offer to me. Have you ever been interested in practicing Buddhism? I said, you bet. Mm. And so he introduced me to my first practice. So this, this is another thing in, in your life that seems to me very clearly connected with the kind of work that you do, or maybe more specifically with the kind of stories that you're interested in telling. Mm. Yeah, maybe so. I, I mean, it certainly impacts the way that I work with subjects mm -hmm. and the way that I approach filmmaking in general. You know, to me, the process is important as the product. And, and I use the filmmaking process, especially now, as an opportunity to mentor younger filmmakers. Uh, and, and never, ever does, um, um, you know, the, 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 the means have to be congruent with the ends, all this, every step of the way. Yeah. So, uh, and I've, I've, you know, I've PA'd and I've worked on other films where that was not the case. And I saw lives endangered and I saw people being treated brutally, I thought. And I thought, you know what, that's not me. Hmm. The, the film, Journey from Zanskar, is the, the general theme of it is the, the threat of loss of culture, of indigenous culture, the, in this case, Tibetan. Mm -hmm. And the efforts of some people that you follow who are working to try to preserve that culture by educating children in Tibetan culture, language, and religion. And I don't want to do the synopsis myself. <laughs> <laughs> what, what is uh, Journey from Zanskar all about? Basically, it's a story about two Tibetan monks who live in this remote corner of uh, India. It's in the, the province called Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, and high Himalayan mountains. Historically, they were part of Tibet, but ever since the British drew the borders of the modern state of India in 1948, suddenly they found themselves in this foreign country called India. Anyway, they get no state and federal support for their indigenous ways. So um, these two monks promise the Dalai Lama they'll do whatever they can to try to save their dying Tibetan culture. So, among other things, they're actually building a school at their monastery, which is a thousand years old, 
that will incorporate the best of Western education practices with indigenous uh, history, language, and culture. But in the meantime, they take 17 young children, and this is the story that we filmed, some as young as four, mm -hmm. all of whom, once they leave home, may never, ever return again to walk over these high mountains to get them into schools and monasteries in Lower India. So basically, the culture is a, the backdrop to the story, which is kind of an adventure story, kind of a road tale. Yeah. But this is just, this is a really remarkable story. You, you have these two monks, they're taking these children on a trek o across the Himalayas so they, can, so they can go to school and study culture and religion and so forth. And the, the hardship, the, you can't underestimate just how rough this is in terms of the demands on the physical, cold, the challenges that come with being at high altitude. Mm. This, was, this was no small thing. And we're not just talking about adults here, we're talking about children. Yeah. Yeah. Well, not only that, I mean, these are, uh, Zanskar is a very poor region and these are very poor families. The monks specifically chose the poorest of the poor because they wanted to not only, uh, you know, try to save uh, the culture, the pet Tibetan culture, but also to give these families a leg up socioeconomically by having them have one of their children, you know, be educated abroad. <laughs> And, and then hopefully some of these kids will return back to Zanskar and be doctors and be lawyers and be mm -hmm. teachers uh, to help their communities, both not only culturally, but economically. Yeah. And on this, you had, a, you had a crew of two. It was you and there was a camera guy. It was just the two of you. Correct. Right? And then I lost the camera guy when we got to lay. <laughs> so we got to a certain point in the story and because of hardships along the way, he had to get back to L.A. for another film shoot. So then I became a one-man crew. Wow. Had you ever done anything this, this physically demanding before? How was it for you and him? Well, you know, I don't want to overestimate. I mean, it wasn't easy, but it... And people sometimes ask me, you know, did you ever think you were going to die? And the answer is yes. But, but, but you know, I don't know. I just... Put it this way, you know, my wife, when she first saw the rough cut of the film, you know, I had purposefully not told her a lot about what had happened, both before I went on the trips and when I came back. So she watches the first rough cut and she goes, are you kidding me? <laughs> she knew none of it. And I said, well, yeah, but I didn't want you to worry. The other thing that I think is really remarkable about this is that it apparently um, there are very few people in the world that can speak Zanskari and English. True. So translation here was a big challenge. But the bottom line is here, as you were going along with these folks and filming, you were filming stuff and people were talking and you had no idea what they were saying. Correct. <laughs> and it wasn't Basically. until later <laughs> when you got someone to do the translation, you actually knew really what you had shot. Yes, I don't recommend this as a way to go <laughs> forward for you young filmmakers out there. Uh, yeah, it's true, and you know, it's it 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 puts you uh, on the the frontier of your resources as a filmmaker, you know, which are really your radar, your open heart, and your instincts. Hmm. And and though what were one of the monks or, or the monks that you traveled with could speak English? Yeah, they they both spoke. Uh, so you could talk. To, so you could talk to them. It wasn't yes. like you couldn't talk to anybody. But oh, essentially, when they were talking with the kids, any of that kind of stuff, you were filming, but you really didn't know what really was. I mean, you probably had some idea what was going on, but specifically what, what they were talking about, you had no idea. Exactly. And you know, so what I would do as a practice would be to try to corral Geshe, who was our main monk. <laughs> find out from him what was going to happen in the in the coming scenes <laughs> and mm -hmm. then so i'd have a broad sense and then as soon as it was over i'd grab him again and say okay tell me what happened this is something that i i also want to make sure we talk about because it, again it, it links up i think something that you feel personally with the kind of stories that you want to try to tell um, i think it's it, true that um, adolescence is a relatively recent invention and that uh, in traditional societies for a very, very long time, people were children and then they were adults. Right. And there was some way that they had 
to mark that transition and perhaps also to, in the run up, <clears throat> to try to train people in the adult role. Mm -hmm. Something that we don't, we don't, we don't really don't know either of those things. Mm -hmm. And clearly, you seem to feel that we're worse off because we don't. Absolutely. And that's something that goes back to your question about, you know, what was my life like with the loss of my father? You know, I desperately needed some kind of initiation when I was a teen, and I didn't get it. You know, uh, there's a proverb that comes uh, from Africa, and I, I'm going to put a researcher on it to find out exactly where. But th uh, that says, if we do not initiate the young, they will burn down the village to feel the heat. Mm. And to me, that says it all because, you know, there's so many young people who they, there's all this energy and there's all this vitality. And if we don't find ways to uh, to hold it and then to help them uncover what positive ends they can put all that energy to, it's going to go in a negative direction and they're going to start drinking and driving and setting fires and beating each other up and shooting in schools and all kinds of other things. So to my way of thinking, it's heartbreaking that, and I put it at, in the last two to 300 years with the development of industrial society and so forth, that a lot of these practices have broken down. Mm -hmm. And my mission, if you will, is to, to um, to to recreate them. Yeah. It, you know, well, actually, you don't have to recreate them, but to just to to just bring them back into the to the forefront of the dominant culture. And is that in rites of passage? That's at least what you were trying to explore with that movie. Absolutely. Right? Yeah, yeah. And there's you know there's wonderful practices that have survived. You know, from the few indigenous cultures in the planet that have made it through to this day and age. Uh, so I want to highlight some of those. I want to highlight some of the new contemporary hybrids, you know, like the weekend workshop I did with the Mankind Project, uh, and others that are sort of in between, you know, a mix of, of both, yeah. uh, because they are out there. Yeah. You, I, I um, saw a little clip, uh, I think it was on your website, on Warrior Films' website, where you're talking about your, your work, where you say, um, and, and, and I, it, it struck me enough so that I actually uh, I, I took it down. And um, you said you're interested in stories that change lives, the lives of people that you've filmed, and the lives of the people who watch the film. Mm -hmm. Do you think that there are important ways that your life has been changed because of the movies that you have made? That's funny because I thought you were going to say because of the movies you have seen. <laughs> no, I'm, uh, I'm thinking. I'm thinking as a result of, you know, of the you know because you hope that you're going to change the lives of the people who watch your movies. But I'm wondering about how your life has been changed as a result of making the movies. Yeah, yeah. No, it, absolutely, it has. There's no question. I mean, I'll tell you what comes to mind, and I'll try to say it without weeping because it just it just pierced my heart, and it still does when I recount it. But I made the film Boys to Men in Newark, New Jersey in 2000 and 2001, and there's an African-American mother there uh, of a family that I filled a teen, uh, Alteran Bowie, who I, I, I filmed for about a year or so. And at one point toward the end of the filming, she said to me, you know, Frederick, your filming has made me understand my own son better, and I believe he understands me better because of you. And it's because I would come around and I would ask her, I would do interviews with her, I think your son is feeling this and da 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 da. And I would talk to him and I'd say, but your mother's concerned about this, you know. Anyway, that really meant a lot to me. The, we're, we're coming to the point where I want to finish up. Maybe a couple things. One thing is the, what I was going for with mentioning Hoop Dreams was that. Uh, some people, I'm sure, would looked at the success of Hoop Dreams and said, well, you can be successful making documentaries. And, and then it seemed that we did have a sort of a mini golden age for, for documentaries. Mm. But I think I've seen some of the things that you've said that suggest that maybe you think actually that was, you know, that peak had, had passed. Oh, definitely it's already passed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was a period of time in the wake of Michael Moore's success and March of the Penguins where 
uh, there were a lot of, there was a, a relative lot of money that was being thrown to documentarians. Uh, but it only lasted about three or four years and then uh, a lot of those films could never be sold, could never make back the money that was put into them. And, uh, you know, even to this day, you know, even though there's a lot, I suppose, fewer high budget documentaries that are being made, there are, there's still a glut of product in the marketplace, frankly. And there's so many docs that are being made that, you know, it's really, really hard to, you know, even with my reputation, and I think I do reasonably good work, you know, to get distribution. I've struggled to get Journey from Zanskar distributed. Mm. Uh, interestingly enough, a French distributor picked it up, blew it up to 35 millimeter, got it into theaters in France, and I can't even get it on television in the United States. That's the big, not only is it a big enough challenge getting the money to make the movie, but then the question is, once you get it made, can you get it so anybody can see it? Exactly. And it drives me crazy because, you know, I, and it's ironic, I suppose, because I started as a distributor way, way back when, but I've always been adamant about, I don't want to be doing distribution. I just want to yeah. make the things. Yeah. So what, what lies ahead for you? What do you still want to do? Ugh. I have a, a shelf of unfinished projects, you know, both fiction and documentary. And, you know, I'm on, if I'm lucky, a two film a decade pace. And it's just too slow for me. You know, I'd like to be making a film at least every other year. So uh, the Rites of Passage one is the next film up. Uh, and then I'd like to actually make another fiction film because that's my treat to myself for doing sort of more social service, if you will. So what, if, if one looked at your films, would, would some sort of personal statement uh, of set of beliefs emerge? I mean, what, what, is it possible to see a message there that, that, say, that you would say, yes, this is what I believe? Yeah, I, it's hard to say over the whole of my 30 years of filmmaking, you know, one single message, but, but certainly in the last 10 years or so, I've been clear about, you know, I'm really interested in capturing human transformation and human transformation that exists in the wake of vastly dominant socioeconomic uh, barriers. You know, so how do these underdogs face all of the different barriers that exist in their lives and still find ways to transform their lives for the better. That's what fascinates me. Yeah. Well, I think that's probably a good a place to stop, <laughs> and stuff we must. Thank you very much. My for pleasure. We appreciate it, Frederick Marx. And I want to say thanks to you, and also thanks to you for watching, and we hope that you will join us again next time for another edition of Illinois Pioneers.